right together. I'll repeat that. Uh, we're going to do a right together session, which um, is going to mean I'm writing in New York and you're writing anywhere that you might be at the moment. So unfortunately, you know, the bad part about Zoom, the good part is that we're all over the world. The bad part is that I can't really see what you're doing. So I'm going to hope that you enjoy watching and participating. And our topic for this uh, brief um, little session is going to be Gothicized Italic, which is an ever popular style of calligraphy developed in the 20th century based on the work of Edward Johnston, one of the, um, uh, the founders of the modern calligraphy uh, revival not modern as in the current uh, definition of modern calligraphy, but the new, um, the new way of looking back at the Middle Ages and earlier times. And Johnston used this alphabet for his artwork, for making uh, manuscripts and books and making beautiful art. So over the course of the last hundred years, students and teachers and the students of the teachers have developed this into a very viable and useful script that tends to, often tends to replace uh, black letter alphabets from the Middle Ages, which tend to be somewhat hard to read because of the, um, the rigidity of the forms and the narrowness of the forms. The Gothicized italic letter forms have more curves, have a little bit more swing to them. And I'm assuming that many of you are familiar with this alphabet. I think this was um, advertised as an intermediate class. But what I'm going to do is review some of the basics without spending you know, the whole 45 minutes on basic strokes. But I want to um, start with uh, a few of the essential facts about that, about our writing and then we'll review some of the letters and in, in groups and then if there's time I'll show you how we can open this up into something a little bit more lively it's lively to begin with but a little more maybe a little more individual so for a start I'm going to switch to my document camera so that we can look at a couple of things and here we go um, focused. Okay. And I am going to use, I have two nibs I've pulled out. Oops, I believe we're upside down. Wait, let me turn that the other way. Okay, there we go. Um, I've pulled out a three millimeter and a four millimeter nib. And I, they're both browse nibs, although if you have other brands, you can use whatever tool you want as long as it's a broad edge pen. So if you have a Mitchell, if you have a tape, um, if you're using one of these, a, a, a broad edge chisel, chisel edge marker, just so you can follow along, that's fine. As long as you have guidelines. And I pulled out two things for my guidelines. I'm going to demonstrate with the four millimeter to make it bigger. So for the four millimeter, I have a piece of layout paper over a page of four millimeter Gothicized italic guidelines, which I drew originally, which have the proportions of three to five to three, five being the X height, three and three being the ascender and descender. Although I will say right off that we sometimes change this. And if you like to work with a three millimeter, and I might show you a little bit, this is eight to the inch graph paper. Now this graph pad comes from John Neal. And the reason I mention that is it has a good writing surface. Not all paper is good to write on, not all graph paper is good to write on, but this pad was made for calligraphers. And the advantage of using the graph pad, if you're working with a three millimeter, is the nib fits just about into one box. So if you're writing with the on a graph pad, what you can do is, if, you know, if you're not terribly mathematical, you can count boxes. You can go one, two, three, four, five, and maybe darken the lines as I'm doing. And then we have three boxes for the ascender, five for the x height, 
and then we can have three for the descender. And one of the wonderful things about graph paper is, oops, I just messed that up. It's always good to have an eraser. One of the wonderful things about graph paper is it has vertical lines and the vertical lines are very close together, which helps you keep your letters vertical. Um, as many of you know, or at least uh, I would say quite a few of you know, I tend to be fairly traditional, really quite the opposite of Marina, I would say, in my approach to letter forms, in that I often, not always, but certainly when I'm teaching, I stay with pretty strict guidelines, measuring, checking my vertical, uh, repeating forms um, many times to get the, the basic form accurate. That doesn't mean that um, I don't loosen up and work uh, with outlines sometimes in my own work, but for learning an alphabet, you know, this is for a beginner, for an intermediate level student, for someone not familiar with this alphabet, try to find some lines that will fit your pen. So with my four millimeter, I'm going to work on this white paper. And then I'll show you just uh, briefly how easy it is to use the graph paper. But I'm going to put the graph paper aside for the moment. Oops, okay. This extra bit of paper I'm going to lean on so I don't put my fingers directly on the paper. So our basic, our basic um, uh, pen angle here is 45 degrees. And as I said, we have a three to five to three ascender x height descender ratio. And there are some basic strokes in this alphabet that I'm going to review for you. And as you like, you can um, take out your pens and, and write along with me. That's what this is called, right? Write together. So here's a downstroke. I'm following a guideline. So I'm coming from a, a waistline to baseline, touching the um, the waistline with the upper tip of my nib and the baseline with my lower tip of my nib. And this is going to be our standard direction of our stroke. Although like textura, which is 12th, 13th century Gothic, the stroke breaks. In textura, we have, this is not Gothicized italic, but this is the underpinning of Gothicized italic. We have a diagonal, looks like a little diamond, a vertical and a diagonal. This is our basic textura stroke. In the Gothicized italic, we take this sharp edge here, sharp edge here, 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 and we soften it to make a curved stroke. Oops, sometimes you have to rub these pens a little bit to get them, um, to get the ink flowing. I also needed to dip it again. Okay, so instead of going over, pause down, I'm going to curve it into the downstroke and curve away from the downstroke to create a shape that looks like this as opposed to like that. So this is where Gothicized italic is starting with this as a kind of skeletal beginning, not even skeleton, a precursor and curving into a looser, slightly rounder form. And that form often, not always, but often will begin with an upstroke that is your standard entrance stroke over and down and over and at the baseline up. So we have an entrance stroke and an exit stroke, which is one of the reasons that we call this Gothicized italic as opposed to just Gothic. Uh, the italic element in this stroke is the hairline, which is not common to um, medieval Gothic. You, you have a few hairlines here and there with the Gothic in the Middle Ages, but not many. It's mostly thick. Gothicized italic has thins as well as thicks. So this is one of our basic strokes, this kind of double curved stroke, which emphasizes the length. Let me, let me do that wrong for a moment. I'm going to, this time I'm going to emphasize the diagonal like that. And you see the length part here is just this part here. This is not correct. 
we want to have a short diagonal and a longer downstroke. Okay, then we have curves. And this again is really quite different from most of the earlier Gothic, uh, with the exception, I'll just mention this so you can look it up. Rotunda is a 16th, 15th, 16th century Southern European Gothic that has very rounded forms. But in the textura, which is all verticals, you have no curves. Gothicized italic has curves that look kind of like parentheses. And these are narrow curves. This is a wide curve, wide curve. This is not Gothicized italic. And this is narrow. And what we do with these two curves, and if we were a regular class, I would have you make a lot of these. First, we would do a lot of those, then a lot of these, you know, going back to what I said about uh, staying with um, precise forms. So we would do quite a bit of this, then we would do these sort of parentheses. But we're, we're going to move along kind of as a review for some of you, and maybe as a demonstration inspiration for others. So I'm going to start on the line here and make the left side of my parenthesis. And then I'm going to put my pen right here, right at the upper edge of my first stroke. And I'm going to do the reverse. I'm going to go in the opposite direction. I usually leave a little bit of thin over there and I attach my pen to that. And this gives me my basic O shape, which is the basis of a number of letters. This stroke, your double curve stroke, and your O shape will constitute quite a bit of the elements of Gothicized italic. If I put my pen right here, holding it sideways inside my O, and I'm going to do another one just a touch wider. Here we go. The width inside, to be a little bit obsessively mathematic, mathematical, is about one and a quarter nib widths. So here's, here's a nib width, right? Here's a nib width, and here's about a quarter of a nib width, just that little bit extra. So the inside of the O is a little wider than the pen itself. So that's, a, that's something to measure for yourself as well. Another thing to notice, and this is quite significant, is that the upper corner, the upper point here, and the lower point do not line up. The upper point is a little bit to the right, if I drew a vertical line here, of the lower point. And this is important because this keeps the verticality of the form. If you take that stroke and come too far to the right and then bring this this way, notice what happens. My O is now tipping a little bit backwards. So to keep it vertical, the upper point needs to be just that much to the right of the lower point. So that's something when your O is going over on its side, when it's tipping too far to the left, you might wanna see where those points are relative to each other. And here I have them almost directly over each other. The upper point is over the lower point and that is making my O lean over backwards. Onward, we have one more form or one more detail really that I want to show you. And then I'm going to make some letters. We've made the O already. So um, this alphabet <clears throat> is characterized <clears throat> excuse me, by a serif. And the serif is very Johnstonian, meaning very much a form that Edward Johnston, oops, Edward Johnston kind of developed. And you will see forms like this actually in English Carolingian manuscripts, but we tend to associate that shape with Gothicized italic and foundational, which are both Johnston, Edward Johnston uh, alphabets. And that is the top of your ascenders. 
And it's the top of some of the minuscule letters. So to start a letter, let's say I'm making an L, rather than starting the L like this, I want to give it a serif. So how do I do that? The, there are a couple of ways. I'm going to show you the easy way and another time we'll look at the hard way. So the easy way is we start with that same thin upstroke and we continue straight down. And then I come back over here and this is what I'm going to do. Here's my shape. I'm going to put my pen over here and I'm going to curve around like this, but I'm going to go off the right edge of the pen. So I'm going to swivel the nib a little bit. So I'm sometimes I go over it a little bit. I'm going to curve and swivel at the same time. And that will create a nice form that is sharp at the end, round over here as opposed to, let's do this a couple of times and then we'll get on with it. As opposed to that, which is too heavy or that where I went too far to the right. So once again, here's the top of my letter. I'm going to come right onto my thin point here and I'm gonna turn my pen as I move it to the right. Just watch the pen as I do this. I'm gonna do that. And I'm. what am I looking at when I do this? I have my eye right here. I'm looking at the inside of the curve to make a nice rounded form. This might take a little practice, but this is one of those, um, oh, as somebody mentioned in the earlier session today, one of those light bulb moment, moments where suddenly you say, ah, I got it, I got it. That, that's not so hard. So that's going to be the top of our ascenders. And I want you to notice what I did on this L. When we did the basic stroke, we did this. And when I did the L, I made a wider curve at the bottom. This form, if you look at the inside, this is wider than this. Some letters, this is one of the subtleties of this alphabet. Some letters have a fairly narrow curve. Some letters even have a narrower curve. I call this a bend, let's call this a bend. So some letters have a bend like that. You can see it's curving just a bit. It's bending a little bit and others like the L, I'll just do the bottom here, have a bigger one. I guess I need some ink. Let me get some ink on my pen. So the difference between the bottom of the eye, let's say, now I'm doing this eye. This eye is going to have a serif. The bottom of the eye, which is kind of your standard bend, and the bottom of the L, which is a bigger bend, is that the letter itself is a little bit wider. If I drew a line down here along the right, the left side of this letter or the left side of that letter, you can see the distance between the downstroke and the point is smaller here than it is here. On some letters, we need to extend that bend. And on other letters, as I said before, just now, we sometimes decrease it. So it looks as if the letter or the stroke is standing on its toes, but it's not bent over to the right. So we'll talk about that momentarily. I'm gonna come back and add my serif here. Here's my serif, here's my serif, and I have my I and my L. If I wanna dot my I, I'm going to put my pen in the middle of the ascender space and notice where I'm starting it. I want, the top point to be centered over this downstroke. So I'm aiming for the center of the downstroke, and then I'm going to make a very modest little curve going that way. Looks like that. Okay, some people do a, a stroke like this, but I think it looks a little too much like an apostrophe. 
I prefer it going to the left rather than going down, but that is that could be your choice. Some people just do that, a little upstroke, but I find that isn't quite visible enough. Onward. So with this basic downstroke, we have some forms that look like this. Here is the entrance stroke. Let me just focus a little better here. Okay, a downstroke and a very small bend with no upstroke. And I'm going to do this and then I'll talk about it. Here is our N. Now, what have I done with the N? First of all, here's my first stroke. I'm just I'm drawing this a little bit roughly. I'm going to put my pen inside the stroke and push up and then come over like that, and then over and down and over and up. I, this is a little too fat, but I think you could, I'm doing this to show you that form and especially so that you can look at the inside space here. The counter of the N looks like that. The inside space is a Gothic arch. And this is one of the beauties of this alphabet, this repeated shape of the Gothic arch and you can see it in here. And this letter is just about a pen width wide. So the N is a little bit narrower at the center than the O, but here's an N. So this part of the N is a little narrower than that because the top and the bottom of the O are narrow. They, they taper to a point. And here we have quite a long, almost a vertical shape. I mean, a, a rectangular shape, not vertical. Okay, so with the N, we can make the M. From the N, we can make the M. Same form, very small, very small bend at the bottom. Let me get my ink to flow a little better. Whoops, ignore that. So we have our small bend at the bottom. I'm now making an N without an exit stroke. The N has an exit stroke and I'm going to come up and finish it. Sometimes, <clears throat> this is not a requirement, but I find that I sometimes end the M or the N with a little bit bigger bend on the right than the first two strokes. We can make the H similarly. And on the H, you need to be quite careful not to go too wide at the bottom. And I'll show you why in a moment. And then I'm going to do exactly what I do with the M and the N, add my serif. Um, if you make that bend a little bit big, you'll see, maybe you did that as you're practicing with me, uh, it closes up the space a little bit. And if it's dramatically off, let me do it dramatically bad. Let's say you do that, you're not thinking. Look what happens. Your H might be a B. So we don't do that. Or if we do, we just do it over. One of the things about learning individual letter forms, letter forms in groups like these, is we often have to repeat a letter. There's nothing wrong with getting it wrong. Just notice it and see what you did wrong and do it again. And the second time or the third time or the fourth time, you'll get it right. Okay, let's see what else. Um, let's look at our O group for a moment. So N, M, H are a group, we can do them. Uh, uh, alternating, look at the white space, look at the Gothic arch, 
look at the bins at the bottom and see how, uh, um, what's the word, anatomically uh, integrated they are. They're very similar to each other. If we take our O, the O is the basis of the A, among other letters, and the C, and the G, and the P, and we can make the first stroke of the A, or the O, and come up. A short stroke across the top, slightly curved, just slightly, and then a second stroke going down. And there is a very small difference between the first downstroke and the second downstroke. And that difference is that the, here's the first downstroke and here's the second downstroke. The second one is not curving quite as much. If you look at the inside contour on the right side of each of these strokes, they're just barely different. And what we're trying to avoid is doing something like that. Okay, I exaggerated that, but if you curve the second stroke too much, it closes up the form. All right, so the A is also the basis of the C. And when we make the C, we keep this stroke, again, ever so slightly curved and short so that it doesn't lean over too much to the right. The A is also the basis of the G. And on the G, we're going to make a stroke that is similar to the right side of the A, but curves back. It's a double curve. On the A, we're doing this. On the G, we're reversing direction like that. We're making a double curve pretty narrow and try to keep the amount of curve at the top and the amount of curve at the bottom pretty close. And from that, we can add a variety of endings like that. In each case, I finish the ending by coming up into the downstroke. There are so many variations on this letter, but we can, we always want the two strokes, the downstroke here and the one, the second stroke, which is coming this way. We always want it to meet the first stroke seamlessly. So what I will often do is come down and kind of move my pen around so that I'm kind of continuing that movement. And then I might sometimes reverse into a double curve. Whoops, see that was supposed to meet seamlessly. <laughs> I'll do that again. There we go. Aiming is very important. You need to know where you want the stroke to go and have your eye on the finish line when you make a letter like that. Okay, with the O, we can actually also do the B. And the B is an L without an exit stroke. And then I'm going to come up inside the letter again, inside the letter and then over, and then the right side of the O. Now you need a big enough bend over here so that the B stands up properly. If I don't have a big, a reasonable size bend, let's say I do it like that. Look what happens, the B is kind of, a little bit off balance. It looks as if it's leaning forward a little bit here. So it's this part that I messed up. That's the part that you need to pay attention to as you're coming down. Okay. 
Um, the P and the B are similar. We have this stroke in the B. I'm going to do the second stroke by itself. I'm coming up and over and then back. And this part is inside. This is inside my downstroke. On the P, we're going to go a bit above the line, come down, and then, well, perhaps we'll do a little stroke like that. Perhaps we'll do a different ending. I'm going to do the same thing here, come up like that. I often will pause at the line and then come around. I'm going to stop before the baseline because I want to make a little stroke like this on the bottom that will meet this downstroke at a point. Here's my serif. Notice that the P is a little taller on the left than it is on the right. The right side is touching the waistline, the left side is above. Let's think about our N for a moment. And if we take the N and make a big curve on the bottom and an upstroke, and then make the same stroke again, we have a U. So the U and the N are related very closely. I can turn my paper upside down. They should have the same amount of white. The difference is the bottom part of the U has a wider swing to create a base for the U. And we often, this is based also on an Edward Johnston model. We often turn this curve here, this curve at the top into a serif. And that would look like that. which kind of makes the right side a little stronger than this shape here. This is something you don't have to do. It's kind of optional, but I think having two bends at the top like this is not quite as, um, it, it doesn't situate in the space quite as well as one bend and a serif. I keep that serif quite small. I'm going to change paper and continue. Hang on. I'm going to take a different paper that perhaps will uh, be a little smoother. Hang on. I'm, I'm writing at the moment, if you want to know what I'm doing. I'm using this Beanfang graphics. And some, it's a good layout paper. Sometimes the pen needs a little, a little more pressure on that paper than on other papers. So I'm going to switch to um, Tomo River, which is a nice, smooth, but rather lightweight paper that I find gives me a very clean line without quite as much effort. So let's see. Let's continue. So what I'm going to do, here's my U, and I'm going to turn the U into a Y. Let's try this paper. Here's my very smooth paper, okay? So this time, again, my serif. So I'm going straight down and I'm gonna curve it out a little to the right, similar to the second stroke of the G, although the G, you see down the, the bottom part is the same. The upper part of the G has that curve. And then I'm going to add my descender. Okay, and what I think I'm going to do, I think I'm going to fill in the letters we've missed because I want to have at least, you know, five, five or 10 minutes at the end to show you a little bit about how we vary this alphabet, especially for those of you who have used, um, uh, have, have worked with this alphabet before. So we've done the A and the B and the C. The D is also based on an O. And when we do the D, we start with our O shape. And this letter is a little tricky. It's going to start a bit to the left of the downstroke. 
and we're going to curve across the top of the letter. This is based on an uncial form. So I'm starting over here. I always start with a little line and then I pull my stroke from the line. And as I come around, I'm thinking about my O. I'm, I'm trying to approximate the width and the shape of the O. The E is again based on the, here we go, based on the same letter. I'm gonna go just a touch wider and has an upstroke. The second stroke of the E is a small stroke. Let me see if I can show you this. I'm gonna show you something with a marker because sometimes there are things that we can see with a marker that are easier to look at than with a nib, with a dip pen, because I can use two colors. I'm gonna put my pen where I would start my second stroke and I'm gonna curve it in. So it goes from about here, it's coming in and aiming for the middle of the first stroke. So again, I'm going to put my pen right here as if I'm making an O and I'm going to, whoops, I'm going to dip it again. <laughs> Out and in and I'm aiming for the center of the downstroke. So this stroke, this top of the E, is a little bit like the O, but really abbreviated. It's half the length and it comes in right at the center of the shape of the first stroke. Now the F is one letter that doesn't have a serif. I should say it's one ascender letter without a serif. And the bottom could be a little stroke across like this one like the bottom of the P, or we sometimes give it a stroke coming from left to right. So it's a little more elaborate. I'm going to, I'm going to do that again. I'm stopping a little sooner. So I have room to make a bigger stroke here. And then we can go across and down, or we sometimes come right into the downstroke and the cross stroke starts just a hair on the left of the downstroke like that, or it continues. I'm gonna continue that line and come across. I will often flatten my pen angle a little bit on these cross strokes. And while I'm at it, let's look at the T. So the T has a little bit bigger bend at the bottom. Here is my waistline. It starts, the very tippy top here is about the middle of the ascender space. And the cross stroke is touching the waistline. The top of the cross stroke touches the waistline, not the center, the top. And sometimes Sometimes we give it a little upstroke at the end. Um, one thing I, I would sort of caution you about is this. You don't want to make little curlicues, but if your pen is moving uh, comfortably and you have enough ink and the paper is smooth, sometimes it gives it a little flick, maybe a little better than that, just because of the movement of the pen, not because you've gone onto the corner and turned. G-H-I, the J is like the, starts with a serif, so as does the I. So it starts like the I. Before we get to the descender line, we pull a little to the left. We add a slightly curved stroke on the baseline. Here's our serif, and the dot is the same as the I. So the I and the J and the T are kind of a group. Okay, again, like the H, keep this bend very small. You can really see quite a big difference here between this 
and this, and they're based on the same movement, but bigger movement here, smaller movement here. And I'll give you a little hint about that. To make a bigger movement, a bigger shape, look at the, the white space inside here, a little bigger white space. Start higher. I'm starting to bend higher here and lower here. So if you start to bend higher, you can make a bigger curve. And then I'm going to come inside the stroke and come over here as if I'm making an H. But this time I'm going to come down diagonally, aiming for the middle of the X space. So here's the middle of the X space. This is very similar to this. And then I'm going to do a stroke that looks like this. I'm going to push back up a little bit and make a slightly diagonal stroke with a bend on the bottom. And a point, there's a point over here. Let me make a, another point about this alphabet that I did not, uh, did not say. Um, this is called pointed Gothic. Almost every letter, almost without exception, there's a point at least on the top or the bottom and often both. So this letter, the K for example, has three pointed elements, no rounded. We never start our ascender like that. This is a pointed Gothic. And um, okay, Dorothy, I'm looking at the clock and it's 10 minutes to uh, 12. So I started a bit late. Is there, a, is there one starting at, at right after this? Oh, there is no. another one. Yeah. Okay. So I I'm not going to make it. Um, I'm not going to go too long. But if I if I go about ten minutes over since I started ten minutes late, is that okay? Okay. So I hope everybody is okay on that because I would like to show you a few variations. But first, let's finish the letters. So we have L M N O P. Q is an O. Here's our O exactly the same O. And then I'm going to put my pen right under it. We're in the descender space here. And I can extend it if I want, extend it like that, and then push up and down and up. So that stroke is a little thin line back up on the thin line. You see, I'm reversing direction. I'm going this way and then that way. Or Sometimes I just put this curve underneath the cue. I don't want the two strokes to collide in any way where they're overlapping. So if you look at this example here, there's a millimeter of thin line between it. Um, we don't want to, um, oh, I did, I did the other cue. I just realized that we don't want to do this. It's not that far away. And I did show you another, or did I? No, I did not. <laughs> okay, so you can do a cue while we're at it. We can do a cue based on the A where we come straight and then add this little stroke on the bottom. So we have two options here, this one and this one. And do notice that the first one does not need to come to the descender line. And in fact, probably would look, wouldn't look as good. Whereas the second one certainly does. We wanna get down to the descender line. The R is going to start like the N. Small bend on the bottom. And again, I'm going to come up inside the letter. Let's, I'm gonna repeat this and I'm gonna do it. I'm going a little bigger with my marker cause it's a little thicker. So there's my first stroke. And I'm going to start inside the letter and come up to here and then curve over. I'm going to show you something. This is a, a little advanced thinking. When you're inside the downstroke, it's probably better. It's generally better to turn your pen a little steeper as you go up and then return to the 45. So I'm a little steeper here and I'm back to 45 here. And why is that? It's because, and I do this with the M, the N, the H, wherever I start the second stroke inside the first stroke, 
if I don't turn the pen a little bit, I might do this. I'm going to keep it at 45. I might do that where I'm overlapping the outside of the letter. So by turning my pen from 45 to a little steeper, I can enclose the upstroke inside the first stroke. And here I'm going to do this here, up and over. Not too wide. You don't want to go too wide on the R because it will affect your spacing. If we had another hour, we would work on spacing, but time is, is limited. Um, the S is a three-stroke letter, starting with a double curve, kind of like the Q. The Q is a double curve going like this. The S is a double curve in the opposite direction. So it curves this way to the left and then the right. This curves up and then down and then up again. It's the same kind of movement. And one of the things to be aware of in both letters is that there's a straight element in the center of the stroke, straight element. So it's as if your S is actually curve, straight, curve, and then it's going to look a little wide when you make it, but when you finish the letter, it will compress back to the right size. I'm going to put my pen a little below center in the X space and make a curve and a straight line to meet. Here it is, curve, straight line, ending with a point. There's our point to meet the first stroke. And the top here is just like the C. There are many variations on the S that we will not get into right now. <laughs> okay, so TU, we've done V, W, X, and Z. And what I'm going to show you is the Johnston version of the V, which is a little bit, um, a little odd to, to us. I'll, I'll show you why. I'm going to turn my pen a little steeper and make a little upstroke and a diagonal that is just barely curved. And then I'm going to, so this stroke is maybe um, 50 degrees, and then I'm going to go back to 45, and I'm going to curve in to meet the first stroke. This is the Edward Johnston V, which on the one hand is a little bit, um, out of the uh, consistency of the other letters until you realize that this stroke here is similar to the O. So the O is like that. And this is a little straighter as you get toward the bottom. But we also sometimes make a V that is based on the U. So we start like a U and then we add the second stroke of the O. And this V kind of matches the U and matches the uh, N, um, where this one is, is it's, it's a bit different. But if you like this V, and I, I suggest you try both, try the W as well. I'm going to have to go to a new line here. Here's our V. And again, a little steeper, and then back to 45. And the Johnston, Edward Johnston W, is the first stroke with an upstroke, and then very close to it, the same stroke again. I'm going to do that a little more attractively. And then the right side of the, of the V. So we have two steeper strokes and then the normal stroke. And I think my preference is to do a W again based on our U. I'm going to come up here. I'm going to repeat that stroke. And I'm going to add my curve. And I think I think this is a little prettier form. However, when you look at the uh, the writing of Edward Johnson, where he consistently uses these forms, I think he might thicken that upstroke a little bit. 
that looks better, a little thicker. Um, it, it creates a very dynamic uh, look to the page where you have curves, you have bends, you have pointy bits, you have diagonals. So his work is very, very lively. Sometimes I want to do this alphabet in a little more um, standardized Gothic way rather than with that much uh, variation and movement, in which case I would use this V, this W, this V, and in fact, that Y, which also Johnston sometimes based on the V. So what did he do? He made a V, he continued, and then made a little flick at the bottom, which is a nice, I like this, this Y. So we have a few variations here. Um, just to, to do the X and Z, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about ascenders and weight to you. So here's the first stroke of our O, a second stroke of our O, a little too much ink. And I'm going to give it a little push to the left on the bottom. If your pen gets stuck, you could make this stroke from left to right. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to overlap it very carefully. Let's look at that in blue. With a marker, it's easy to push to the left. With a pen, sometimes the paper resists. I'm going to overlap this very carefully with a C. So you have a stroke going to the left and a stroke going to the right. I'm trying to keep the center one width the width of the C or the width of the, the O shape, but not a double width. So we want to avoid we want to avoid this. And you could see why. It creates a letter that's too too fat. And then we take our pen, flatten it a little bit and make a little stroke across and perhaps a bit perhaps a bit up at the end. So I'll finish this in ink. Here's my C. I don't want to make that too long or the letter will topple over a bit. Flatten my pen a little bit, horizontal stroke and up. And last is the Z, which is slightly curved and then aiming for short stroke aiming for a point on the baseline directly below the beginning of the first stroke. We have a, a straight diagonal and then a little double curve like that. I'm gonna push up a little bit and down and up and the same cross stroke you have on the X. So let's look at that one more time. The reason I'm saying one more time is this is a little better than that. That's a little wobbly looking. Okay, now this was really too fast if you've never done this hand before, but maybe you got a little sense of how it works and how very connected these letters are to each other. So in our extra 10 minutes to make up for, um, since, you know, since Dorothy is giving us a few more minutes, um, I would like to tell you that this alphabet has so many variations. We don't even, I can't even begin to show you more than a few, but the very first thing that I'm going to say here is that we sometimes vary the, the, the weight and where we have an A that is five pen widths, Sometimes we want to make an alphabet that's shorter. And now I would normally draw a line. I, you know, me and precision, I like to get keep this precise. But I, this is about half a pen width. This is if this is five pen widths high, this is probably four and a half. And if I wanted to make it four, that would be here.
And if I wanted to make it six, it would be, look at the difference. Wow, huge difference. I'm trying not to compromise the white space, although I went a little bit wider here, but you wanna to try to keep the white spaces the same. By changing the X height, you can create a different alphabet. You can have an alphabet that is denser and blacker or an alphabet that's lighter weight and thinner. And when you have an opportunity to look at some of the work of Edward Johnston, he did exactly that. He did pages, maybe I can grab one, wait, wait. Uh, it's not immediately in front of me. Okay, I'm not gonna go searching, <laughs> but he did some texts which we can find in books which are reproduced, which I distribute when I teach this class, um, where the letters are quite dense and quite black. And to make them dense and black, he made them shorter. So if I made a B where the ascender is shorter and the X space is shorter, this is quite a bit shorter. I can change the character of this alphabet dramatically. And similarly, if I decided to make them taller, same pen. And this is something you might enjoy playing with. Find out where you want to go with this alphabet. Do you want a blacker, denser, more gothic looking, gothicized italic? I'm going to help with this a little bit. Or, come on, I'm focusing. Okay, or something lighter weight. Now, in addition, we often make some changes to the ascenders. And I'll do just a couple for you because we are going to run out of time. But if you decided that you want to stay with your standard X height and shorten the ascender, what you could do is leave the ascender um, serif out. We can take the serif out and we can do something like this. We can make a little upstroke. And from that upstroke, we do what I call a pullback. We come this way. So I'm moving the pen a little bit, slightly curvy into my upstroke. And it creates a pointy ascender. Here you can see it. That has a little bit of character, a little more character, say, than just doing this. Or even doing that. I think this is not a very interesting top to the letter where doing this can give you um, an interesting relationship between ascender and X space. Similarly, or let's say alternatively, we can go higher. And this is where everybody loves Gothicized Italic because Let's say this is an H. I'm not changing the X side. I'm not changing the width. I'm starting from right to left the way I do when I make the F. The top of the F starts with a little stroke going this way, right? It starts that way. And we can add to the top of that letter a variety of decorative forms. We, I put my pen right here because I want the two strokes to touch at a point. And I can go across and curve down. I'm going to run out of paper. <laughs> Let's do a couple. I can now notice these are touching at one point. You don't want the ascender to cross over like that. It gets too, it's too thick and you lose the grace. I can come diagonally and in. I could do this, I can come down. I wanna be sure, notice here, I'm emphasizing this point. I'm emphasizing the, I'm even emphasizing that point. And then I could do something like that, or I'm 
I'm now working without lines. Or I could do this and come across. So there are things you can do with the ascender to make it flourish. It's flourishing. So if you are doing a line of writing, let's say a piece of calligraphy, a document, somebody's name, and there are a couple of ascenders on the top line, you could decide what you want to do with them. You don't have to make every one a, um, a serif. Here's one more. I'm going to start directly above. So I'm going to start in a line with the center of this stroke. And I'm going to do this. And then if I want to, I'm going to put my pen in the same place and do it again. So I can make a variety of this. Get, this is getting very tall. And you, you just want to be careful. I probably would want to steepen my pen angle a little bit so this isn't too heavy. You see, it gets a little too thick. It's a little thick for the downstroke. So I would, especially with a four millimeter nib. Um, similarly, there are things you can do with the descenders. Um, you have a couple of ways of doing the Q. You can change your S to a form that goes this way. You could do the same, the standard or the one, I would say the one I prefer, and you could curve this up. There are little changes you can make to make these letters more interesting, not more interesting, but just more. So instead of curving down and up here, I'm gonna curve down on the R. You can do different things with the bottom of the F, the bottom of the P. Um, I'll just stick it in, <laughs> I'll stick it in here. So if I, instead of doing this, I could do that and make it a little bit more of a swing. And I wanna be sure that this is pretty straight and maybe it's curving a little bit at the beginning and the end. Same thing on the F. And sometimes on the F, I just want to make it smaller. So I might do this. And by giving it a little diamond to stand on rather than extending it the full length, I'm simplifying that form. You know, in the interest of everybody's uh, time, I'm going to stop and just uh, ad advise you that we have scratched the surface. We've barely begun. And if you're a beginner, I would advise you or you know, suggest that you work a little bit on this because in order to do things like this, make these changes, you have to have some uh, comfort with the pen, with the, um, the pen angle, the curves. This is a particularly difficult form. It's it's too easy to go a little bit too wide on it. Uh, work on the serif. Uh, work on this rather subtle A shape where the right side is just a bit straighter than the left side. So what I'm going to do is uh, go back to my um, me, and um, I don't know if anybody has a question. You, you can you can ask you can unmute yourself or put it in the chat or you could you know stagger out of here after an hour of marina an hour of me maybe you need a nap maybe we need a nap marina question i don't know yes. so Leica wants to ask you can you show how you hold the nib how you are loading the nib how oh i'm 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 dipping i'm working with ink and I'm dipping the pen into the ink. If I was working with paint, um, I would, um, I'll, I'll just change this. So, oops, come back. So let's say I, I have um, paint. I would be holding my pen sideways. I would have a brush. I would take some paint from my brush and I would slide it under the reservoir on both sides, but not underneath. It's it, and I'm not painting the top. I'm kind of dripping it into the space between the reservoir and the nib. So I would just kind of 
press the brush against that. And working with paint, that's a whole other study. Once it's in the pen, you need to get it started. I wouldn't go directly from pen to paper without doing, actually, I've been doing this with my ink too. Every time I dip my pen on the side, which you don't see, I'm, I'm making a couple of marks here. I'm gonna dip my pen and I'm doing this. And if it's too wet, I drip a little bit back until I get a nice fine line. And it's probably easier to see on this slightly smoother paper. When I get that fine line, I know that my stroke is gonna be really clean. If my pen is too wet, it's gonna be a little bit blobby. Okay, other questions? Uh, Dorothy, anyone else have anything to inquire? Um, so no, uh, do, does anyone have questions? If you do, you can either unmute or you can type in the chat. Mm -hmm. Or you could Good email story. me. I don't mind uh, Pam, uh, uh, Paramdeep Desai, can you suggest some good papers to work on? Oh, well, it depends on whether you're, when you say work, it depends on whether you're making art or you're practicing. Um, for practice, I have recently discovered this paper, which is called Tomo River, which is from, uh, from Japan. Um, it's T-O-M-O-E River. And it's, this is what I used on the second page here. It's a little bit lightweight. It's a little, it's quite thin. And I always tape it to my guidelines. You can see I have taped it at the top here and here because it tends to move around a bit, but the quality of the line is really nice. That Beanfang uh, Graphics 360 is usually good. Canson Pro Marker Layout is usually good. Uh, I, I say usually because um, uh, mass produced papers, sometimes you get a better batch and sometimes you don't you know you might be using a paper that you love i'm talking about pads of paper um and the next pad you buy is not as good so you need to try your paper and with your ink or with your paint and sometimes one paper works very well with um walnut ink but doesn't work with um uh, sumi and another paper works well with sumi and doesn't work with higgins so test your paper test your ink and find the combination pen nib ink and paper need to coordinate um to give you ease of writing and my solution may not be yours thank you so much ma'am ma what's your awesome. email id what's your email id please um, you know what? I'll put it in the chat. Um, let me do chat to everyone. Here's my email. Winters V D P. I'll put it up there at Winters V D P at AOL.com. There you go. And um, yeah, I, I answer questions if um, happily. Or if there you is need guidelines or whatever. Yes. From Imelda, how to not easily tire when writing with broad edge pen? Okay, two things. Number one, don't hold your pen too tight. Sometimes we get um, kind of tense. And, and I, I say this in full acknowledgement that I tend to hold my pen too tight. So I try to keep it without squeezing it because that makes your arm tired, your wrist tired. The other thing which I definitely do and I recommend is to take breaks. Um, and so, you know, you have to be aware of your own body. And if you can work for half an hour and then you're getting stiff or your hand is tired, get up and walk around. You know, have a drink, take a walk, or or stop. Sometimes we have to stop. Some people can work four or five hours. I cannot. And I will say, full, full disclosure, I work less. I can't work as long doing copper plate as I can doing broad edge, because copper plate is a lot of pressure and release, and I do get tired. And I see it in my work. the The letters deteriorate. And once they deteriorate, I have to give my hand a break, maybe my head a break. So take breaks. 
you know, be good to yourself. We, most of us uh, do calligraphy for pleasure. Um, if you're doing it commercially, if you're getting paid to, to do it, sometimes you have to work longer hours. And my feeling is um, I've had enough of that. <laughs> I don't want to do that anymore. So, you know, a thousand envelopes. Okay, any, anything else before we uh, take a break and, and a nap? Okay. I totally agree with you, Eleanor. <laughs> no more envelopes. No One more certificates. Envelope. No, no more sitting spa places and a, and a table. <laughs> oh, you betcha. You know, without, without telling you, you know, any numbers, I will say I started doing freelance work, which was largely weddings and such in the late seventies. So if you, you know, you count those decades, it's enough. Somebody else could have drunk those envelopes. Yeah. I'm happy to share that work. So it's nicer to make art, right, Marina? Yes, much nicer. <laughs> and to teach. I love teaching. I love yes, doing this. as well. Yes. Yes. Oh, if there are no more questions, I can uh, stop the recording.